A chorus of opposition comes back. Not a single one of them sees sense. I take a scoop of my dilute Terran wine into my beak before swallowing it back. You just don't get it. There are millions of them. They hunger for our flesh. They bite us, and then we become one of them. How can you say that zombies are less threatening than we are, complains Dawan. I can say it because it's true. A Terran zombie is just a Terran, with everything that makes you Terrans a force to be reckoned with gone. They're slow. They're stupid. They don't plan. They don't coordinate, cooperate, communicate. They can't track you over land. They can't mentally keep track of objects, not currently in their awareness. They can't trap. They can't deceive, beguile, betray. They won't hold a grudge. They can't make tools, usually can't use tools. They're often depicted as being physically weaker than standard Terrans. And the biggest thing is that they have no sense of self-preservation at all. An animal can learn to recognize a gun and work out that guns equal sign death equal sign bad. A zombie can't. They're only scary when they're already in overwhelming numbers, but they would never get to overwhelming numbers because of how unthreatening they are when they're in small numbers. If one of you, even Taylor, suddenly stood up and announced they were going to try and bite someone, the rest of you could probably stop them before they succeeded. That's what a zombie's doing all the time by being a zombie. Wait, objects Aaron. What was that you said about not keeping track of things mentally? Because they like gather outside buildings. They've seen people go in and then they stay there. That means that they're mentally tracking that this is a building with a person in it. Or, I counter, they just keep doing whatever they're doing. And the fact that the Terran who went into this building was what started them doing it is irrelevant. They'll just do it until something comes along to displace them from it. I take a moment to breathe. A Terran would be all like, well, I saw them go in there, but I can't get in there. So what else can I do? Sam chimes in here. Liking people lots and lots. Deadwalk people scary being, not liking. I try to mimic a Terran smile and say, thank you for your input, Sam while giving him an appreciative scritch. Akaros, that death world body is solid. He wags his tail and pants excitedly before leaving the room, likely to go and tell Fluffy that he got scritches from Captain Bird Mummy. I'll tell you why I think you're really scared of zombies, I announce. Enlighten us, smiles Taylor. I think exactly because they're so unthreatening. Cocking his head, Sunberry asks, can you elaborate? I'd be happy to, I preen. It's because they're so pathetic, so meek. So slow, so stupid. But if they bite you, they'll make you that way too. They'll rob you of all of your inborn gifts of mind and body. If they were impressive, you'd want to be bitten by them like vampires. Vampires are basically everything that Terrans are, but more. Despite the clear drawbacks, tons of Terrans want to be bitten by a vampire. Precisely none of you are like, ooh, bite me, Mr. Zombie. Boom. I chitter boisterously. The rest of the Triple M common room are clearly trying and failing to come up with a counter argument, though that might be because they are just as intoxicated as I am. Taylor stands and says, well, looks like my drink needs refreshing, eh? and looks like the nachos and salsa are running out. Anyone need anything? There's a brief hubbub as drinks are requested, after which he looks at his hands and says, anyone want to help me carry all that? McLeod volunteers with a helpful smile. A few moments pass as conversation at the lounge end of the common room moves on to how quickly Bruce Wayne would be identified as Batman, and Taylor and McCloud move over to the kitchen end to fetch the beverages and victuals. Once they've returned and passed out drinks, Taylor says, guys, watch this. He proceeds to pour a sauce bottle I recognize into an egg cup and slide it to me. Knowing it's safe both from trust in Taylor and past experience, and having been unmistakably indicated to do so, I take the egg cup in my talons, tip its contents into my beak, and tilt my head up to swallow. It has the same calorie-dense, rich, flavorful impact as all Death World foods. A mix of savory and sweet, like a green pepper or a tomato. The instant it is in my mouth, all the Death Worlders erupt in shock and excitement. You'd think I'd snapped a tungsten girder in half with my bare talons. I have no idea what they find so impressive about me drinking this California Reaper sauce, but don't want to spoil the moment. McLeod is struggling to open the jar of salsa she retrieved from the kitchen. It honestly seems like an egregious overdesign to make a container that even a death worlder can't open. She gives up and hands it to Taylor. Could you open this for me, babes? He sighs and pops it open with only slight effort. You know the Omni appliance can open jars for you, he asks dryly. Yeah, but that's uh, uh, the way over there, she says, gesturing back to the kitchen with mock misery. Plus, then I'd have missed the gun show, she smirks. 
I really don't know what exhibitions of firearms have to do with anything but. When you spend time with Terrans, you learn not to interrupt the conversation to clarify every idiom you don't understand. If you wanted a gun show, your Amazonian girlfriend is right next to you. She could have taken your breath away with her muscular jar opening, quips Taylor. Ah, gun show must be an allusion to physical prowess and displays thereof. Now what does Amazonian mean? McLeod latches protectively onto her much larger girlfriend and says, she has nothing to worry about, but there's no harm in looking. You and she can both spare a bit of all that beefcake for us delicate little members off the fairer sex, right, Toon? Toon was making a barely perceptibly injured expression before she seemed to return to herself and answer, Erm, um, yes, that's right, uncertainly. I scoff delicate? I don't think so. Human women must have extremely intense copulation rages. What? Say Taylor, McLeod, Dawan, and Toon in unison. I look around the table, and it looks as if none of the triple M's know what I'm talking about. Hesitantly, Zunbury asks, D, do Rakali women have a copulation rage? I chitter, of course not, but human women do, right? Tilting her head, Aaron prompts, what makes you think that? Oh, well, I've inferred it myself, I suppose, but I don't know what other explanation there could be, I say, getting a little defensive. Explanation for what? Asks Toon. Hesitating, I say, honey, <laughs> wheel, for what I saw on the handful of occasions, I've accidentally walked in on CSS Taylor making use of a mating sim. For a moment, you could hear a pip drop. Then McLeod squeals and says, OMG, Deets, what did you see? A similar reaction is rippling around the room, everywhere except in Taylor's seat, where sits a man who looks as if he's witnessing a murder in slow motion while paralyzed to inaction for some reason. Confused, I shrug. I mean, we're all adults here. We've all used mating sims when single or when at a removed distance from our partners, haven't we? They are being extremely weird about this, like fledglings in the school canopy. No adult reacts this way to talk of mating sims. Dawan prompts, I think what Jenny means is, what did you see in Cuddle's mating sims that made you think human women have a copulation rage? I gesture at him and say, well, he's right there. Why don't you ask him yourself? It's then that I notice his face is glowing in the IR spectrum, and he seems to have entirely ceased responding. Something's going on here. Zunberry says, seems like Taylor isn't here at the moment. Why don't you just tell us for him? I look around and see that everyone has that same cheeky death world smirk. Well, not everyone. Taylor is fixing a blank stare at the table, and Tun is giving more of an expectant, hopeful expression. I finally give up and say, I saw that the women needed to be quite heavily restrained, muzzled, bound, chained, etc. And I naturally concluded that if they weren't, they'd be a threat to those around them. First of all, their mate, due to some sort of copulation rage. Is that not accurate? Two-thirds of the Terrans and four-fifths of the humans present burst out laughing. Annoyed now, I say, okay, if it's not for copulation rage, why do they need to be so restrained? Managing to calm down enough to talk, Aaron says, no, you're exactly right. We human women absolutely lose our minds during the act. If proper measures aren't taken, people can get really hurt. I knew it, I exclaim. Why were they all so strangely evasive about it only to tell me now? Does it only change your behavior or is your strength also affected? Do you remember what's happened after you return to your senses, I ask. After a moment's hesitation, Zunberry responds, well, no one's quite sure if it actually affects their physical characteristics or just unbridled strength they already have. Studying it is quite difficult for obvious reasons, barely suppressing giggles. As for the subjective experience, he glances at Aaron and McLeod. Vague impressions, snapshots, says McLeod. Aaron nods enthusiastically. How does it work for you two, I ask them. Do you have to restrain each other? How can you do that in a way that you can then participate? How can you restrain yourselves enough to be sure you won't break free during, but can then free yourselves afterward? They think for a moment before McLeod answers. FF couples need a third. Their job is to restrain both in such a way as we can perform, but not hurt each other. They don't participate, she smirks, usually. I consider this and then ask, and who's your third? Grinning smugly, she nods at Taylor and answers, Cuddles, of course. Ah, oh, that makes sense, I say. I can't imagine anyone I would trust more to tend to me in such a state of vulnerability. I look around and see the beaming smile on all but two faces. Taylor is still blankly focused down, and Toon looks as if she's just been shot. Guys, Taylor says, only barely above his normal speaking volume, but with an intensity that silences everyone, his eyes still thousand yards staring through the table. He looks up. That's enough. Stop messing with her. I'll explain. One very baffling explanation and many pipettes of wine later. And most humans don't have this proclivity, I ask uncertainly. No, he responds mirthlessly. 
And it's embarrassing, I say timidly. Yeah, he responds, still grim. So I shouldn't have exposed that? I inquire, terrified that I've jeopardized my friendship with him. No, he responds with bleakness unending. At this, Zunberry nudges him and interjects, I don't think we can call you a triple M anymore. I think you're a triple S from now on to General Snickers. In horror, I blurt, you would eject him from the dorm for this, from the social group. There are general guffaws at this, and they reassure me that it was a joke that missed my beak or went over my head. Taylor, I'm extremely sorry. Rakali don't advertise our bedroom activities, but we don't have such an intense culture of embarrassment about it. We would give a frank answer if asked and wouldn't feel at all ashamed. I didn't think before I spoke. I'm sorry, I plead desperately. It's fine, Cap, he says, exhausted. I wouldn't have had it come out this way, but it doesn't look like anyone's ready to burn a friendship over this. In a way, I'm glad that I have the opportunity to have this part of me accepted too, he says, smiling lightly. Aaron looks at him, smiling, and says, Cuddles, you're going to make me cry, you big doof. What's going to become of my badass space bounty hunter image if that happens? Who knew having your kinks exposed could get so touching? Taylor smiles back before looking around his apparently newly firm friends and saying, Yeah, I'm glad me. Now how about a subject change? Have you seen the eye that Quidge has been making at that new retige in research? The conversation moves on to speculation about shipboard romances, potential romances, and speculations on the mechanics of various interspecies unions. At some point in the evening, six Terrans become 12, then 24. 12 who are only there in the IR spectrum, and 12 who only appear in the visible. Fluffy got here at some point, I go to her. That nose is extremely boopable. I boop it. Very satisfying. She brings her head to the floor so I can scritch between her ears. By the 17 gods of Akeros. She's so soft. This is paradise. Then I see Taylor's face. My victor. The boy from Earth who saved my life on my first mission as captain and countless times since. The boy I hired on the spot and sponsored through so training. The boy now become a man. Korak may be the love of my life, but Victor is my strength. Then I ask Victor, do you want to be Takak's godfather? The next morning, I'm lying down. Why am I lying down? Rakali perched to sleep. Why am I lying down? And why do I feel like a Terran has run me through a juice press? I open my eyes to see Taylor sitting by my hospital bedside. He's noticed me stirring and is pulling a smirking face at me. So this is what it feels like from the other side, I quip. He laughs at that. What happened, I ask. Pausing a moment, he speaks. I gave you a three milliliters pipette to dilute your drinks with at the beginning of the night. At some point, you managed to, I assume unwittingly, exchange it for a 15 milliliters pipette and didn't notice. I don't bother asking if he's sure he didn't give me the wrong one originally. If there were any doubt, he would blame himself. It's my fault. He blames himself when I should have noticed. I scoff at that. You should have noticed from across the table what I didn't notice in my claws, I query wryly. It's my job to keep you safe, Cap. The pipettes shouldn't have been in a place where you could have confused them. Once you confused them, I should have noticed the new one didn't look right. You even said it tasted as strong. I should have. I hold up a wing claw and silence falls. This isn't your fault, Victor, I say simply, letting my words hang in the air. Eventually, he nods and says, all right, Cap. I nod approvingly before asking, so then what happened? He shifts uncomfortably before answering. Well, then you were a sparkling conversationalist about Terran pop culture. You accidentally exposed my preference in Matt and Sim material. We gossiped. You went to pet Fluffy. That was when I realized something was wrong. You asked me to be your daughter's godfather, and I picked you up by your feet and carried you here, like a prized turkey to get your stomach pumped. He lists matter-of-factly. Wait, what? I squawk. What was the last one? You being a prized turkey? No, the one before that, I say with a flick of my crown plumes. Oh, yeah, you asked me to be Takak's godfather. I was really touched. I'm dumbfounded. Eventually, I say, I told you we're expecting and I named her. He cocks his head. Were you not supposed to? No, it's terrible luck to tell anyone, let alone name a child before they hatch. Rakali don't even do parental seconds. What was I thinking? I bury my head in my wings. I feel a very gentle but very powerful hand on the back of my wing and look up. I see Taylor's emerald eyes staring back into mine. It'll be okay. And my answer is yes, by the way. I chirp appreciatively. Well, what's done is done. Thank you. Sorry for being such a terrible guest. You were an amazing guest, but I think next time I'll dispense your drinks. He smiles. I'm invited back, I say, a little incredulous. Of course, he scoffs before continuing. <laughs> well, I should probably get going. Your breakfast will be here soon, and I've got duty later. As he makes to leave, I say, 
Before you go, Victor, I just want to apologize again for exposing your kink in front of your friends. He smiles. Actually, Cap, I should thank you for that. After I dropped you off here last night and got shooed off by the nurse droid, I went back to Triple M and got waylaid by Toon. He's clearly very pleased, but I'm unsure about what. Oh, I prompt. Let's just say that she and I have some common interests. And you helped us realize. It takes several seconds for me to put together what he means. Eventually, I get there. Oh, Taylor, I'm happy for you. He nods excitedly. Just then, the nurse droid arrives and places my breakfast in front of me. Happy for the food, I ask. What am I having? The nurse droid uncovers the platter and says, Pancakes, Captain. Loneliness, 13 years. Before Fluffy, the galaxy is vast. It contains 14 billion terrestrial planets. Of those, half are life-bearing. Of those, one in a hundred are currently host to a permanent sapient population. Of those, only a little over 30,000 are cradle worlds of sapient species. Of those, one is a death world. Light years separate stars. The size and quantity of objects that can move through the void without being detected is immense. This was a lesson my polity, the Galactic Union, learned hard, all too recently. Around 20 years ago, we discovered that our society had been cohabiting the galaxy with another domain. This wasn't the normal first contact situation, where we'd find a species bound to one planet, maybe with a few extra solar colonies. They had a territory that already made them the most numerous single species in the galaxy. Hundreds of planets and 1.7 trillion souls. And they'd been hiding right under our eyes, and yet in the last place we'd look for them, on death worlds, worlds where the gravity is high enough to crush our silicate bones, worlds where wildfires rage, worlds where winds whip and storms howl, worlds where the plants are locked in a death game with each other, greedily monopolizing every last nutrient and ray of sunshine that they can, worlds where even the herbivores are ready to kill unprovoked because they have to be, worlds where predators stalk and venomous creatures lie coiled and waiting, Worlds where a single microbe would be enough to lay waste to the ecosystem of an entire garden world. Worlds where the very crust fractures and chafes against itself, roiling out streams of lava across the land, flattening buildings with earthquakes, washing away coastal towns with great waves. Worlds where the suns stream a constant barrage of lethal radiation to crash against powerful magnetospheres, only just able to hold them at bay, but still letting through enough to bathe the surface in mutagenic rays. And what had these death worlders to say of our garden worlds? The appropriate, sane places for life and sapience to develop and inhabit? Unfit for settlement. The selfsame thing we had declared of their species chosen expansion grounds. Their complaints? Sun too weak, not tectonically active enough. Atmosphere too thin, climate too stable. Ecosystem not dynamic. Crop growth too calorie poor. Gravity too low. Could never support settlement. Could never produce sapience. We hadn't found the Death Worlders hiding in our midst, and they hadn't found us surrounding them, because neither of us were looking in the right places. And the worst part, they had spent centuries screaming into the void, begging to be found, pleading for anyone to tell them they weren't alone. They had found life, Death Worlds are not Dead Worlds, but no sapience. In frustration, they uplifted their companion animals, built AIs, resurrected long-dead cousin species, unsatisfied with their lot of loneliness. They changed it. If the universe wouldn't give them company, they would make it. Death worlds have always terrified garden worlders. The stories that come back with the few survivors are the stuff of nightmare. Death world sapiens have been a monster of myth for longer than there are surviving records. Hell forged bodies, hell forged minds, hell forged intelligence, and hell forged malice stalking you. The thought is enough to make the most grizzled veterans in the galaxy quail and cower. It was less than two months after news of the discovery broke that the GU Parliament declared a war of annihilation against the Terrans. Death Worlders couldn't be reasoned with. Death Worlders couldn't be placated. Death Worlders would not stop until they had brought death to us all, they said. 750 trillion souls marched to war against 1.7 trillion and were utterly routed. We were millennia ahead of them, technologically. They didn't have nanotech. Their computing was a fraction as powerful as ours. They were still dying at the end of their natural lifespan. They lacked regenerative medicine. They didn't have FTL comms. Didn't have FTL tracking or targeting. They didn't even have proper translators. Despite having thousands of languages, they relied instead on a culture of polyglottalism. In the face of all that, they humiliated us. The casualty disparity was immense. Hundreds of us died for every one of them we killed. When we sent elite units, composed of some of the very few hypercarnivorous sapients, their ferocity paled in comparison to that of death worlders. 
When we tried to make use of our tech edge, they would reverse engineer it, our millennia of engineering, by the very next time we fought them. When we spun up the engines of our industry, theirs spun up faster. On the rare occasions that we would capture one alive, they would tear through the containments we had assembled as if they were made of tinfoil and proceed to rampage through our ranks. Terran children and pets laid waste to battalions when we tried to take their worlds with the ground forces. We attempted to glass their planets and they stopped us. They always stopped us, like they knew what we were thinking before we thought it. Almost none of the Terran casualties were planet side. Over 99% were void side. That was my domain. Fresh out of officer training, at 16 years old, I took to the stars in a starfighter. Rakali are some of the only sapients that have the instincts for dogfighting, and we are undoubtedly the best, or we were. Human fighters outstripped us to the point that precognition seemed the only plausible explanation. In the year that I served, I didn't manage to shoot down a single one of them, but unlike nine-tenths of my classmates, I survived. I watched and retreated with the GU forces as the Terrans pushed us back and back, taking and occupying planet after planet. We wept for the poor souls lost to Terran occupation. The barbarism, the carnage, the atrocities, the brutalities, the care, the empathy, the kindness, video after video after testimonial, after undeniable piece of evidence came from those occupied worlds. In war, the Terrans had been every bit the monsters we thought they would be, and so much worse. But in conquest, Terrans in white clothes with red symbols on brought food, medicine, blankets, tents. They brought all the things they would need to tend to the homeless, the hungry, the sick, the cold. They taught us the word humanitarian. They taught us the depth of compassion that must flourish in you when your home is hell itself. They taught us that we were wrong about them. They were such a lonely species for so long. And when they finally found fellow beings to offer a hand of friendship, we recoiled in horror and tried to exterminate them. We were the monsters. After seven years of war, after 20 trillion, 2.7%, GU dead and only 70 billion, 4%, Terran dead. We capitulated. We surrendered. We invited a Terran delegation to the GU parliament to discuss the terms of our surrender. The best we were hoping for was that the Terrans would declare themselves our overlords and force us to give them everything we had to give to repay them for the heartache we had caused. The galaxy watched with bated breath as the broadcast was made of the peace conference. Into the parliament strode the United Terran Coalition's representative, backed by four bodyguards. It was such a strange sight to see Terrans in their people's formal wear. We were used to images of them in battle armor and, as of late, white and red uniforms. It drove home again that these were people, not monsters. She sat, and what followed was the most furious dressing down of a room full of powerful people that likely ever has or ever will occur. Xenophobia, genocide bigotry, war crime, crime against peace and fucking were all words and concepts introduced to the non-death world galaxy that day. When the speaker bravely asked if the Terrans intended to seize control of the GU and turn it into their own expanded territory, she scoffed and answered that they weren't orts and they weren't imperialists. Two more new words. Their insistence that they aren't and don't do any of these things is marred slightly by the fact that they're the only ones with words for them. With great care and demonstrating more backbone than I'm sure 99.9% .9 of the garden worlders in the galaxy would have been able to, the speaker asked, if you don't want to rule us, what would be adequate recompense for this blood debt? The Terran thought for a long while before answering, we don't want anyone else to die. Enough of us, and Christ enough of you, have died. You made us slaughter more than 10 times our total population. Just to survive, you can atone by first telling us that you're sorry, then showing us that you're sorry. You can make this up to us by treating us as equals. You can make this up to us by ensuring that this never happens again. The next time you discover beings that frighten you, we'll be here to make sure you extend the olive branch first and then don't bludgeon them with it. We can forget about blood debts and focus on healing and transforming things so that nothing like this is ever possible again. Over the coming months, the Terrans took their seat in the parliament and negotiations on reparations began. The Jew gave a formal apology for the slaughter, and so did the UTC, which no one was expecting. The Office of Death World Relations was established to search for new Death World sapients and mediate with the ones already known. It was scrupulously staffed with 50% Terrans and 50% Garden Worlders. Against their protests, the Terrans were given exclusive settlement rights to all the galaxy's hundreds of thousands of Death Worlds. It was a hollow gesture, 
they weren't really ours to give. We may control the space around them, but those planets were so hostile to us that we never would have been able to develop them ourselves. Like giving water to a fish was the analogy the Terrans used. It got the point across after some translation struggles. They rightfully also pointed out that if they settled all these worlds, any future Death Worlders would be left out in the cold. So unbidden, they announced a regimen that saw a portion of Death Worlds left unsettled for any future Death Worlders and ensured the preservation of any local ecosystem. For worlds they did settle. We've shared technology, innovations, medicine, philosophy, law, and we've both learned so much. The results have been better than anyone could have hoped. And yet it's been 14 years since the peace. And while hostilities have not resumed, the Terrans describe the current state of affairs with words like apartheid and cold war. Separated by planetary classification, the Garden Worlders and New Death Worlders have barely mixed at all. There are fewer than a million non-Terrans living permanently across all their settlement worlds. And the number of Terrans who've taken to the stars among non-Terrans currently sits at around the same. Terrans have taken their seat in the parliament, but scrupulously avoid voting on anything that doesn't directly affect them. We need more, more integration, more participation, more innovation spurring cultural exchange. There's so much to learn from death worlds and death worlders. Death world research has yielded uncountable new improvements to the galaxy's quality of life. But death worlds being death worlds and death worlders being so rare and guarded in wider space, there have been numerous instances of researchers being sent to death worlds without a Terran because none could be found. The results were predictable. That's why mere months ago, the GU declared that a Terran escort was obligatory on Death World expeditions and requested the Office of Death World Relations to draw up requirements for a qualification that will come into effect in the next few years. That being done, all that was required was someone to negotiate the establishment of this course and agree to be captain of the ship that would be the first test case for this new Terran security officer position. Those would both be me, Kakal, 27th daughter of High Spire Peak, who's currently stood on a shuttle descending to hell itself, the home of death, Earth. Ma'am, Shaanza has been making objection about Regulation 17.4. It's making her nervous. I flap irritably. We can't ban pets if we want Terrans, and we can't restrict the kinds of pet they're allowed if we want them happy. It stays as is. I look at the pretty male holding a hollow pad with clear concern plastered on his face. Remind me of your name, soldier? I don't need to guess that he's a soldier, though definitely too young to have fought. It's Korak, Captain. Your clan mother hired me as your secretary and personal assistant shortly before the bright plume departed. I chitter at that, did she now? The old woman does so like to play matchmaker. Listen, Korak, I'm sure you'll make some woman very happy when you agree to life bond one day. But it won't be me. Is that understood? His face is unreadable as he says, perfectly, ma'am. I avoid asking why a secretary would be on a surface shuttle to spare the boy any further embarrassment. The shuttle door cracks and begins extending out to form a ramp, allowing the thick, soupy Terran atmosphere inside. It reveals the roof of the 1,500 m tall reception of non-Terran dignitaries building, located in a megalopolis on an island off of one of Earth's land masses. An armored Terran strides up the ramp, blocking my egress, gun slung at his side. If someone asks me to define overkill, he glances between me and my new secretary for a few moments before settling on me. You are Lady Tuak Kal, 27th daughter of High Spire Peak? Captain, yes, I answer. Do you have a gravitic compensator and an aerial microbe denial field equipped and engaged, he says, without apology? I gesture to them, strung on a sash, unnaturally draped across my chest. He looks at them a moment before seeming satisfied. I'm afraid I'm going to have to enclose them in the tamper-proof case. We've had some instances of garden worlders accidentally disabling personal welfare devices recently, and the results weren't pleasant. This is now policy. The case will be removed before you reboard. Do I have your permission to do that? I give a Terran nod and he clips a transparent case around my devices. Akaros, it feels sturdy enough to survive a bomb blast. That done, I'm shown across the roof to a lift which takes me to the 169th floor where my appointment is. I walk up to the door of Ambassador Jean Blitz Miyazaki, the selfsame woman who stormed into the GU parliament and berated the representatives like fledglings all those years ago. And it is 1026 ER 583, A. Ezra. I drum my talons against the desk perch that the ambassadors have so graciously had provided. It's unusual that I'm here alone. 
Terrans only do diplomacy from paired couple to paired couple. It wasn't always that way. It was apparently a habit they only picked up after leaving their cradle world, pre-contact, and it has become a policy since, but I'm unpaired, and the only qualified person who is willing to take this job, so they're making an allowance. I know that the skills required would require turning out a galactic arm to find experts on in garden world populations, but the Office of Death World Relations assured me that finding these experts on Earth would be a trivial matter, I say cautiously. The mechanical man fixes his eyes on me and says, in a perfectly level voice, Captain Chakal, as my wife explained, it isn't a matter of finding instructors, it's volunteers that are necessary. A pause. None have come forward. There are tens of billions of people on this planet, I exclaim, losing composure. None? Ambassador Miyazaki turns her eyes to me from the window. Diplomats can shake hands. Ma'am, governments can issue apologies, but the people out there, she gestures out of the window. We can't make them forgive and forget. The fact is, they don't trust non-Terrans. After your catastrophic mishandling of our first contact, almost every single person on this planet lost someone to the GU's attempted genocide. Many of them don't believe you sincerely changed your minds about us and think that, rather, you just wanted us to stop slaughtering you by the trillion. And, if I may be so bold, the wording you had us use was off-putting. Off-putting? How? She takes her holopad out and reads, four-year course at the end of which you will be serving under a Urkali captain who has nothing but the utmost respect for Terrans and the restraint they showed during their occupations of the first contact war. She tosses it onto the desk. That's off-putting. It sounds like you're still thinking of us as monsters. I splutter. <laughs> How? How can you have got that impression from that wording? I do have nothing but respect for Terrans. Certainly, I hated you as I watched all my squadmates fall to your prowess during the war. But when I saw the videos, I understood. You weren't monsters. You were lonely. You had reached out in friendship, and we responded with war. I came here in a ship with a brand new Terran-modeled AI. I'm certain you didn't, interrupts the Terran AI correctly. GU law won't allow fully sentient AI, so it had to be modified to a state of semi-sentience. The only reason this rule doesn't apply to Terrans is because no one's been brave enough to bring it up, knowing what the answer would be. I continue, I feed my crew with death world origin crops. I've spent the last five months neck deep in researching your culture and history to be able to connect with this prospect, whoever they were. I'm here to sponsor a Terran security officer and hire them to my employ. How could I give you the impression that I think Terrans are monsters? Ambassador Ezra answers, Human beings are highly perceptive and sensitive of context, Captain. This is precisely why the GU has passed this law. Often what is not said is more glaring to them than what is. You need to understand that they don't see their behavior during our occupations as a restraint. That would imply that they really wanted to run amok, pillage, burn, loot, cannibalize, but were stopping themselves through force of will. This is not so. They cared for those whose worlds they occupied because that was what they wanted to do. Admiring their restraint is still fearing their prowess, not appreciating their humanity. You're just admiring the fact that they're not using their prowess. Ambassador Miyazaki smiles at her husband. Exactly, sweetheart. No one wants to work for a captain who seems to think that they're a monster. Her straining themselves, she thinks for a moment, before turning her focus back to me. Even if they are. Even if you think that. Though I don't know why you'd volunteer to be the test case captain if you did. Plus, if you want a Terran, you can't treat them as just a Terran, you know? <laughs> We're not a monolith, and no one wants to feel like they're only valuable for what they are rather than who they are. If you want them to save lives, you need to make them feel like you trust them with your life. If you want their loyalty, you need them to feel like they have yours. If you treat them as just the ship's Terran, you'll never earn their trust. They need to feel like they can invite you to parties, discuss nonsense with you. You need to be approachable, not just a Terran wrangler. Frustrated, I ask, so what do you suggest? She chuckles. You could always meet some Terrans. Go out and get to know some people. Offer them a job once they've warmed up to you. She's mocking me and it feels infuriating. You know what? I shriek. Perhaps I will. I, I need to be approachable, after all. I make for the door and Ambassador Miyazaki is frantically trying to call me back. She knocks a glass off the desk with gesticulation. It shatters. Titan. It was made of stronger silicate glass than my bones. And it shattered from a zero nine milliliter drop. It wasn't even full. 
It's a good demonstration of why exactly I need the gravitic compensator. Ambassador Ezra says, Captain, this is most inadvisable. With the level of anti-garden worlder sentiment on Earth, we would never suggest leaving the building without a bodyguard. Almost sounding like he's going to express an emotion other than serene calm for a moment. I turn, fixing my four eyes on the warm woman and the cold man. Affecting a single Terran laugh, I say, Ha! You two tell me I need to trust this prospect with my life, and then you tell me to approach them with a bodyguard? Oh yes, I trust you completely. Never mind the two hunters and four and a of armed and armored death worlder behind me. I'm going and I'm going alone. If you want to stop me, do so. They know they can't. It would breach every diplomatic protocol to detain me here, even for my safety. My stupid decision has no obstacles. I stride out of the room to the lift. I descend. I walk through the ground floor reception area. The receptionist wants to stop me. I stride past his desk out the door. I breathe in the air of a death world city. I continue. I walk past the historic palace that once, centuries ago, housed the emperors and empresses of a death world, maritime empire. I stride past that empire's parliament building. I cross a river. I pass an enormous monorail terminus. Occasionally, I stop to talk to one of the lumbering death worlder giants, all of whom are fixing me with the bemused expression of a father whose child has suddenly started expressing an interest in quarret hunting. None of them give me the answer I want. None of them are interested. None of them are interested in helping me find someone who is interested. I walk on. This would be much easier if I could fly, but even with the gravitic compensator, that's not possible in two. One GSG. Eventually, I find myself at a dead end. I turn around to find my way barred by three adolescent Terrans with cruelty in their eyes. The same cruelty that we imagined was there in all of them when we declared our war of annihilation. What are you doing on Earth, then? Asks the apparently leader. Oh, well, you see, I'm a diplomat, sent to recruit a Terran to serve as a test case for a new rank, which could help to foster a golden age of prosperity in the cooperation between garden worlders and death wo No, you ain't, interrupts the one on the right. Yeah, that's right. You're here to kill people, ain't you? Like you killed my dad. And my grandpa, adds the lead one. And my sister, adds the one on the left. No, truly, I've never killed anyone, even though I served in the war. Ah, so you tried to kill us and couldn't, smiles the lead, cruelty white hot. I stumble backwards and trip, landing on the ground. The leader reaches down and lifts the sash off me, over my head. These look valuable, he says, admiring my devices through the perspex. No, wait, stop, you'll kill me if you take those. He smiles, either not believing or not caring. Then faster than I can resolve, he's bleeding. I look left. There's a fourth boy who wasn't here before. He's holding a length of wood that looks like it had been discarded on the ground. The next 30 seconds are a blur as this new boy flashes between the others. I can't actually see him swing his improvised weapon, but I can infer that he is from the sickening crunches and screams of agony from the other three. As they turn to run, the new boy grasps my sash and wrenches it from the leader's hand. The leader hesitates, but sees the copper-haired boy's menacing feint of his stick and the look in his eyes before seeming to decide it isn't worth it. My assailant's vanquished. The boy drops his bludgeon, turns to me, and holds out his hand. You all right? You didn't notice him following you? I hesitate for a moment before taking his hand. He pulls me up and hands me back my sash. Thank you. I owe you my lives, I say breathlessly. It's nothing. Those guys are arseholes. I know them from school. Saw him following you from across the street and knew they was going to do something stupid. I look up into his eyes like emeralds and say, how would you like a job? Four months after Fluffy. Two six simmer of hell-forged body, hell-forged mind, hell-forged intelligence, and hell-forged compassion stands. Fifty simmer to my right, cooing over my egg in its incubator. How long's it been, he asks, with heartwarming smile still fixed on Takak. Oh, I'd say about four months, I respond, amused. His face turns to confusion. Oh, really? Isn't that a long time? Secreta. If you are about to compare Rakali to Secretary Birds or any other non-sapient death world avian, don't, I interrupt, still mirthful. He shrugs and returns his gaze to her, thinking. After a long time, he says, So, is that where you were when I went to Atexia 3? I chitter. Just so, dear boy, I was recovering from laying. I enforced a strict ado not disturb for two days and emerged to find two notifications. Victor Taylor engaged with a Texian merc beast followed by Victor Taylor hospitalized, and I ran to the medical room where you were sleeping, thinking you'd been savaged by 300 keiko of dangerous local fauna, rather than savaged by your own loneliness. He chuckles at that. How's the new Triple M working out, Hasiak? I ask, remembering the six miller of scarlet reptilian 
who recently took residence in Triple M after passing the Fluffy test. Hasi, Hasi's great. Hasi's so sassy. We love her. She's a big fan of the cuddle puddle, but says it makes her a bit too energetic to sleep. You're not apprehensive about sharing your living space with a venomous serpentoid. He laughs. Definitely took a little getting used to, but we're all friends now. Plus, Cookie says her venom only hurts about as much as a bee sting, so... Wait, she bit Dawan? How did that happen? His smiling gaze still fixed on my egg, he responds, Not mine to divulge, I'm afraid. You'll have to ask him next time you come to Triple M. I stare, disconcerted for a few moments, before I'm satisfied that, if he's not concerned, it's not something I need to be concerned about. Taylor's calm buzzes, he brings it to his ear. Hello? Toon's voice comes through, tinny but audible. Baby, get back to Triple M, something's happening. I'm not angry, I lie. Yes, you are, the voice behind me states simply. I'm not angry, I say with the thief's own honesty. Cap, you're clearly... All right, fine. I'm not angry, I'm furious. I'm livid, irate, incensed. Taylor's language has so many words for different shades of anger, from miffed to apoplectic. It's worth embarrassing myself with the way my beak mangles them to get the point across. I take a deep inhale of the oxygen-rich atmosphere maintained in this dorm for Terran comfort, and watch the stars slowly parallax past each other out of the window. Cap, I really didn't know. When I picked her up, she was wild. I thought she was gaining weight because she had access to all the food she wanted. I tried having her do more exercise. I thought about putting her on a diet. I'm glad I'm such a weak will when it comes to those sad eyes. It probably would have been bad for them if I'd put my foot down. I wheel around, my face screwed up in rage. The five humans, Don and Sahas, all turned down their faces in shame. I'm not angry that you brought in a Texian merc beast onto my ship with a litter in her belly, Taylor. I'm not angry that you misread the signals of pregnancy. I'm not even angry that you got yourself injured by her. Whatever I used to think, and however it may sometimes seem to me, I've seen enough of your stupid decisions and blind spots to know that humans aren't clairvoyant. I'm at peace with that, Taylor. I move toward the man with his right arm bruised and slashed, now attempting to convey my hurt with every gesture of myself. I'm angry that you kept it secret. You didn't trust me with this? Ten diurnals? What did you think would happen? You thought you could smuggle them off the ship somewhere without anyone noticing? Then what? Suitably ashamed, he answers. Cap, I'm sorry. We, I didn't know what to do. We talked about it a lot. Eight of them's a breeding population and that's a crime. Doesn't matter that they're siblings. We decided it was better if you had plausible deniability. I really didn't do this because I didn't trust you. I sigh and flick my crown plumes. So why are you compromising my plausible deniability now? And what made her injure you? Well, to the second, she seems to have undergone behavior changes. We haven't been able to do the cuddle puddle since she delivered. She growls at us when we go in that room. He looks around at the rest of the triple M's. We wanted to know what was up, so these guys convinced me to get her a translator and ask. She was snarling at me as I approached. I only just got it on her before she gashed me. To the first, it's what she said. He trails off here. I chit and ask, damn it, Taylor. Don't make me drag it out of you. What did she say? Still hesitating, he answers, I think she said she'll only talk to you. I close my eyes to process that. It takes some time. Eventually, I ask, where is the uncertainty? What exactly did she say? Victor gives a mirthless smile and says, we'll... She asked for the feather grandmother. I can't think of many contenders. Massaging my temples with my wing claws, I try to work out anything. Eventually, I settle on asking. I don't suppose she gave any indication of what she wanted to speak to this feather grandmother about. Did she? He closes his eyes and shakes his head. No, she definitely wasn't in the mood to talk, so I left and calmed you. I consider, then respond. So, do you have any ideas for questions you want me to ask her? Taylor indicates to Zunbury, who starts, We'd like to know if she knows how long the Merc pups... He's cut off by McLeod or Merkittens, or Merklets, consensus not yet reached. He continues, yes, thank you, Mouse. Anyway, we'd like you to ask if she knows how long they need to suckle before they can be weaned, and if she understands what has caused her behavior change, and how long that will last. We'd also like to know if she forms a pack unit with them after that, or if Merk beasts are solitary. The literature seems to suggest solitary behavior, but it's difficult to be certain given how impossible it was to study them up close until recently. Finally, we'd like to know what she wants to do. Confused, I ask, what do you mean what she wants to do? What might she do? Zunberry looks at Taylor, whose face is a mask of anguish, before turning back to me and responding, 
GU law forbids breedable populations of death world predators being removed from their planet of origin together. One Merc beast is legal as a study sample or pet, but if we keep her young, we'd be breaking the law. So realistically, she has two options, or actually, I suppose, two decisions to make. Where does she want us to take them? And another glance at Taylor and his watery green eyes. Does she want to leave with them? I look at Taylor, my anger melting away. Victor, it's fine. Cap, he lies to see. I love her. Lots. But if she wants to go, I won't force her to stay. I won't ask her to choose me over her babies. He clears his throat, I'm guessing, as an attempt to keep his voice from cracking. Mage's sisters got some contacts in, what was it? Death world faunal taming and domestication research. Or we return them, and possibly her, to a Texia three. Those are the options. If we give them to my sister's colleagues, then they will be given to volunteers to see how they take to life as pets. These would be people who will have been thoroughly personally vetted to make sure they would be loving providers if they take to domestication as well as Fluffy did. Until recently, then their genes can be sampled, recombinated, and variated to be able to produce new domestic merc beasts that can then legally be distributed to those licensed to have them, or we release them onto their cradle world. Or, I suppose, you could get an eye patch and a peg leg, and we all become pirates. That joke catches me off guard and I laugh. After thinking a moment, I resolve myself and say, Taylor, get yourself to the medical room, get that wound seen to. What? Cap, it ain't that bad. God is going to try and convince me to get my scars regened. He always does. That is an order, Taylor. I will not have Terran wounds festering with Terran germs on my ship, no matter how many decontamination fields are permanently active to keep you walking plague pits from infecting us. Also, to be frank, I agree with Dr. Gatto. I know you think of your scars as sort of trophies, but... He shakes his head. Not trophies, Cap. Lessons. I resign myself to never fully understanding Terrans for the five millionth time. Be that as it may, you are to have that wound treated. And I don't care how much you have to argue with Dr. Gatto about the merits of retaining scar tissue. Maybe you'll get one of the shings. I'm sure they'd be delighted to hear your philosophy on scars ass lessons. I have a furred granddaughter to counsel, apparently, so I shan't be accompanying you. Zunberry, could you go with Taylor? Make sure he doesn't faint on the way. Zunberry doesn't get to answer as Taylor says, wait, you're going now? I nod, now is the moment. If I have to turn the ship around and start heading back to Atexia 3, I'd prefer to know sooner than later. Then I should go with you, he says insistently. No, no, you shouldn't. She's made it quite clear that she doesn't want to see you right now. I gesture at his wound, and I'm quite sure that even you wouldn't be able to do anything in the zero two seconds. It would take her to squash me flat, if she wanted to. Whatever these behavioral changes are, I've seen enough of her to know that she wouldn't ask for me to do me harm. I'll go in alone. I stay with more confidence than I feel. He's still unconvinced, so I concede. Aaron and Toon can wait outside the door. If I need help, they can be in there as fast as lightning. Do you trust them to keep me as safe as you could? Taylor looks at his subordinates before saying, I trust them completely. I guess I'll see myself to the medical room. Or Mage will see me to the medical room. Is that all right, Mage? Zunberry smiles. Of course, my friend. And after only a moment's more hesitation, the two men leave side by side. My heart sinks slightly at the task before me. Turning to my SO and ASO, I say, shall we? Dawan and Hasiak stand as well. Well, Hasiak less stands and more raises her upper portion from her coiled tail to put her head at about the height of Dawan. They take each other's hands. We'll come to, I know I'm a cook and she's a prison guard, but if Fluffy needs to be held back, it might take more than two, says Dawan, his partner nodding at his side. Interesting how much faster than most she's picked up Terran mannerisms. Is that because she's sharing their living space or because she's a rough worlder? With a mirthful exhale, I say, if you two want to raise next subcycle, I might be amenable. No, they laugh. We head out of the common room and down the hall to where Sam stands guard outside Taylor's door. He'll want to smell you, Captain, says Aaron. He's been smelling all of us when we take our turn on guard. He's checking that we are ourselves and that we don't smell like hostility. My mind boggles at the facts that Terran canines have the ability to detect the odor of hostility the intelligence slash wariness to use that ability on trusted friends, and the fact that Terrans ever domesticated an animal like that. Why exactly did you take up guard shifts outside the room of an aggressive merc beast mother? Isn't she her own guard? Aaron chuckles. We weren't really guarding her. We were guarding anyone who might be stupid enough to blunder into Triple M and start opening doors from her, that death world caution. As I approach, 
Sam splays his front legs in a posture of readiness. I'm reminded that as much as he is a loving, friendly, sweet creature, he's every bit as much of a death world predator as the one in the room he's guarding. I extend my wing to his nose and he sniffs it. Happy smelling, he proclaims, satisfied and incorrect. I'm definitely not happy, but I'm guessing that was him giving the all clear. Thank you, Sam, I say before turning to the door and gesturing for it to open. I walk into the half-lit room and see a giant mass of infrared curled into a crescent with eight much smaller masses nestled into it. Rendered into a Rakali, a husky voice addresses me. Not changing horizon, my translator is not able to give me a clarification on the word that it has flagged as being inexact. I have to think. Of course, she's from an eyeball world. She lived her entire life in the narrow band between deathly cold night and scorching hot day before being adopted. Venturing in the direction of one horizon would increase the brightness, the other would decrease it. She's asking me not to change the lighting. I won't, Fluffy, I'm told you asked for me, I say, cautiously approaching her head. Yes, not danger being, but respecting safe talking, both. Confused, I ask, both? She clarifies, you not danger. Can't harming babies, even if wanting. You not danger being not overcome being me. Safe being both. Another unclarified inexactitude. I think instinct. Some sort of instinct of parental protectiveness. Fluffy, can you control yourself when you are overcome? She chuffs in seeming irritation. No, that what overcome meaning. I did not expect to receive a semantics lesson from a semi-sapient when I woke up this morning. You said you respected me? Taylor, your daddy tells me you called me grandmother? Yes, feather grandmother's so weak, strong. I'm going to get a headache with all the discernment I'm being forced to do. Weak, strong? You mean my body is weak, but you think I'm strong in other ways? Is this another example of a death worlder perceiving me to have the spirit of a death worlder? She shakes her head. Terran mannerisms are so mimetic that they even spread to semi-sapiens. Not thinking, knowing, seeing, brave being, only weak seeing since living in Starcave. Accepting weak cute for licking. I laugh. You know you really scared Hamtonio? He thought you were sampling him. He was certain that the last thing he would ever see was the inside of your mouth. She gives a deep laughing purr growl. Sorry being, too cute, needing licking. Overcome. I step forward and cautiously place my wing claws on either side of her nose. At this distance, there will be nothing the Triple M's can do. I really hope my trust is well placed. Fluffy, I know you think I'm a grandmother, but the truth is, I'm not even a mother yet. Though I will be soon. If you're looking for advice on motherhood, I can't give you the benefit of any experience. She shakes her head again, and the raw power of her body is made evident through my wings. I'm almost pulled off my feet. Not true! Daddy's mother being. Also aunties and uncles, mother being, them not knowing long, already trusting you, already loving you, you wanting happy for them, you getting angry when we stupid being, kin child not having, but mother being, and grandmother to me, and small cousin, my kin lonely being, not understanding loving and kind until daddy and grandmother meeting. Another thing I didn't expect to be told today, I'm touched. All right, Fluffy, we have a lot to talk about. Why don't we start with your questions for me, then? Your daddy, aunties, and uncles have some that they want me to ask you. I walk through the door to the medical room. Dr. Gatto is sat at his desk, seemingly perusing medical files of the crew. If you're looking for the scarred wonder with his latest addition, he's in the last bed. The shings are seen to him. I'm certain he'll be more scar than man by the time he's a couple of centuries old. If he survives that long, he says without looking up, Thank you, Gatto, I say warmly. It might not sound like it, but that was about as cordial an address as he ever usually gives. For him, that was the equivalent of a friendly greeting. It used to bother me, and it doesn't anymore, for some reason. I round the corner and see the line of empty ward beds. The one designed for Terrans is occupied. Beside it stands Zunberry, and next to him, Dr. Shing, Nan, and Nu, the Terran specialists. I hired the last time we stopped for repairs. It was Zunberry who located them. I wonder if his recruitment method was similar to what I now know Dawans to have been. For Hasyak, he has been visiting their private living quarters in their off-time foreskans and interviews a lot. Wait, stop. That's not my business unless they choose to tell me. I can't be filling my head with speculation about potential gossip, no matter how juicy that gossip would be. I draw closer and can see that Taylor is shirtless. His wound is healed and he is animatedly explaining the origin of his many scars that he is keeping as mementos of Seemingly the times he failed. The one before me of Fulgentians are listening with rapt attention, their furry red and white tails twitching in reaction to the story. 
It's so fortunate that we managed to find two doctors with such an expertise on and passion for Terrans, so far from Terran space. I draw close and say, excuse me, Dr. Shing, a little above my normal volume to catch their attention. They both jump. Sunberry turns his head in surprise, but gives no indication that he feels at all disconcerted. Taylor smiles and says, hey, Cap. Of course he noticed me approach, but managed to keep from making that apparent. Captain, it's a pleasure to see you. What can we do for you? Asks Nu in her throaty voice. It's so nice to barely have to look up in order to address Fulgentians. I think I may have a mild repetitive strain injury from spending so much time conversing with non rakali who tower over me. I was wondering if you might excuse us. I have some things I need to discuss with my CSS. Dr. Shing look at each other before Nan responds, Of course, Captain, in his high, comely voice. Zunberi, you can stay if you want, or you can have it from Taylor later and go back to Triple M or with Dr. Shing for one of your sessions. He smiles and says, I'm sure Cuddles will fill me in. I'll go with Nan and Nu. Thank you, Captain. I watch as the three of them walk away. Zunberi puts an arm around a shoulder of each Shing and pulls their shoulders to rest against his hips. Gossip confirmed. Not that I'll bring it up. Once the three of them are gone, I turn to Taylor. So, what did she say, Cap? He asks with quiet, pleading desperation. I respond, well, bearing in mind that she's only got about as much articulation as Sam, and I don't have a Terran's preternatural ability to almost always produce the correct inference. He chuckles. I think she told me that she's extremely sorry for hurting you. It seems that motherhood has induced an uncontrollable protective instinct in her, and she can't control herself from lashing out at beings she perceives could harm her young. She asked for me because, evidently, her subconscious doesn't perceive me as a potential threat. I pause here, but he doesn't interrupt. Just keeps fixing those baleful green eyes on me, begging me to continue. <laughs> she doesn't know how long she needs to suckle them or how long her instincts will be in overdrive. She doesn't really have the same concept of time as you or I do. With no day and night cycle on her cradle world, she had nothing to measure it by. She seems to have developed a time measuring system based on daddy sleeps since coming aboard the star cave, but she's also a first time mother and she confirmed that her species is solitary. She has no inclination on how many daddy sleeps it would be as she has no memory of her own mother nor familiarity of other merc beasts postnatal experience. And Cap, what did she say about his eyes now overflow and tears stream down his cheeks? She has agreed to give them to Zunbury's sister. She says that her instincts tell her that they won't be able to cohabit for long with each other, and that them being given loving homes like you've given her would make her the happiest. I'm on my way to plot a course to Zanzibar Mimpia after this. He closes his eyes and smiles through his still streaming tears, leaning his head back against his pillow. Thank you, Cap, and damn, I'm sorry. That'll take us weeks out of our way. I'm really edging you closer and closer to the red, aren't I? Actually, Victor, I might need to return the ship to Terran space anyway. This might just be when yeah, killing two birds with one stone, as you Terrans so brutally put it. I laugh as he winces apologetically for the unfortunate phrasing of the idiom from his language. Interesting that he's apologetic, given the bird here was the one who said it. He frowns and opens his eyes. Why would we have to go to Terran space? I heard nothing about this. Ah, well, that would be because I was already on my way down to Triple M to tell you about it and ask why I had barely seen any of you for the last 10 diurnals. When I got your cum, he winces, sorry again. There's someone we might need to pick up for a contract that GU has just offered us. I'll tell you about it in the morning. Get some rest. Either here or in Triple M, you look haggard. Terrans are the only species, to my knowledge, who are capable of stressing to the extent that it visibly affects their health. All right, Cap. Me and Toon will just have to speculate all night about the nature of this contract, he says, getting up. He begins walking off and I call out, Victor, there was one more thing Fluffy wanted me to let you know. He stops and turns back to face me, his eyebrows raised. She wanted me to tell you that she loves you and to thank you for sharing your home with her. His tears return. So you've decided, I ask uncertainly. We have, responds Taylor, his emerald green eyes set and serious. And your decision is, well, we decided. He shifts his position in the love seat beside Toon. We decided on Merklets, he says, raising a Merklet from his lap to coo into its face. I'm glad the ship's most controversial issue ever is finally resolved, I mock dryly. We had an all-night discussion. The crew gave us some great suggestions, but Merklets was the clear winner. I was surprised. My bet it had been on Merkittens. Merkits was very popular. Looked like it might take the lead for a minute there. 
Merc pups was another that people were tepid on. Other suggestions were fluff kits, merc peeps, murkies, dust kits, flufflets, merc bites, merquats, mittens, mercubs, mercubs, nuglets, merc nuggets, very popular, cuddles, might have got confusing, flumps, standing for fluffy murder potatoes. One crewman was surprisingly resolute on an English pun involving the slang verb merc and some of my favorite from the crew, gloam kits and murmurs. Well, I'm not surprised it took all night to decide. What with how incongruently indecisive Terrans and apparently Sahas can be about trivialities like what the cutest name for the cute thing is. What about individual names? This, he gestures at the one with the largest eyes and widest mouth, returned to making a bed of his and Toon's laps, postface cooing. Is Chesh that? He gestures at the only one with fully black fur, nestling into Hasiak's stomach on the floor. Is Knox, that's Catbus, gesturing at the largest, squarest one, wrestling with the end of Hayshik's tail. That's Kit, that's Gloam, that's Murmur, that's Nugget, gesturing at the smallest, only purple, most slyly mischievous looking and roundest ones, respectively. And that, he gestures at the single albino, is Snowflake. And were eight all nighters of Gimo required to decide on those, I say, with a mirthful chitter? No, they just sort of came out and we all agreed on them. Obviously, everyone's fluffy approved. I reach up to Sam's ear to give him a grateful scritch. He's been assigned as my bodyguard in Triple M while it is a churning mass of chaos with eight to six to eight kg merklets who don't know their own strength or my weakness, tumbling hither and thither. Every now and then, one of them gets curious and tries to approach me. Sam effortlessly redirects them and they quickly lose interest and resolve to play with one of the sturdier beings. I look at Hasiak with Merklets burying her, coiled into Fluffy's stomach. Her slit pupiled green eyes are crossed, and her boyfriend is admiring her from the couch. You all right, Hussie? asks Dawan. Just drinking at the oases of warm and soft, she says, still apparently stupefied by her condition. Dawan feigns woundedness. You're saying this oasis isn't enough for you? Gesturing at himself. You're warm. They're warmer. You're not soft. You're an oasis I drink at to satisfy. Other thirsts? She's probably fine if she has the wherewithal to flirt. Dawan, McLeod, Aran, Toon, Zunberry, and Taylor all give mirthful whoops, hollers, and whistles to indicate appreciation for Hasiak's brazenness. The noise stirs the eight, fluffy beans, to great excitement, causing Sam's bodyguard services to be called on to make sure none of my bones get broken. Once things have calmed down, I ask, how's the weenie looking? Zunberry answers, it looks good, it really didn't take long. They're still suckling, but they've all started sampling some of their mum's food. Fluffy says she feels like it's about halfway done, which puts us nicely on track for our arrival at my homeworld. I guess in the wild, merc beasts must undergo a sequential niche transition as they grow, meaning that they don't need to suckle for too long, which works out nicely for us. And Fluffy, um, I say, causing that enormous head to raise and turn toward me, you're still at peace with them being given to Terrans as pets? You're at peace with possibly being the progenitor of an entire lineage of domestic merc beasts? You're sure that after Zanzibar Mempia, you don't want to keep your translator? I don't know what I'll do if she says she's changed her mind and wants to go back to Atexia 3 now that we're so far from it. Peace being, happy homes for kinchilds wanting, proud of all mother being, words getting in way, take talk box if needing, signal having. She returns her head to the floor and closes her eyes again. Why any two creatures would ever choose not to be able to communicate is beyond me. But Taylor and Fluffy are weirdly agreed on the fact that their relationship is better without words. She has agreed to keep the translator until the Merklets are transferred to the Death World Faunal Taming and Domestication Research Department of the Tasisi Ya Utafiti Na Technologia Ya Zanzibar Mpia, Zunberry's old university. What's the signal? I asked Taylor, sensing Fluffy to be in the mood to rest, not converse. She stamps all her forelimbs. That means she has something to say and wants us to put a translator on her, he says, attention seemingly entirely focused on Chesh, but still able to answer me somehow. A few moments pass, as the only movement in the room is eight merklets and the reactions they get from the triple miss. Then, turning his eyes to me, Taylor speaks. I'm really not a fan of the shortcut you've plotted, Cap. I want to say again that I think we should stick to the cleared space lanes. Taylor, I say, activating a 3D map projection of the 1,003 light years currently around the ship from my holopad. 
You know, sticking to the cleared space lanes would take us a month longer, I say, highlighting the circuitous route he wishes us to take. By that time, the Merklets might be starting to reject each other's company. I truly do not wish Death World predators to kill one another aboard my ship. It would be a crime to allow that to happen, saying nothing of the fact that they're Fluffy's babies and extremely adorable, even to me. The shortcut. I zoom in on the narrow point we're currently traversing, where two cleared lanes come mere light years from intersecting, will require an extra stop to de Gauss, but still puts us being there, right on schedule. Still rubbing his hands on Chesh's thoroughly fluffed sides, his attention is now entirely turned on me. It's unnerving to be so focused on, even by a friend. Cap, pirates? Did it occur to you that pirates might be thinking the same thing you did? What a nice little shortcut. Perfect place to just hop between lanes, save a long trip round. If it's the perfect place to stray from the lanes, it's the perfect place to set an ambush. With the interstellar haze uncleared, we won't see them till they're right on top of us. I wave my wing dismissively. This is one of those occasions where death world caution runs away with them. Taylor, pirates are exceedingly rare. The GU estimates the galaxy's total population engaged in piratical activities to be only in the tens of thousands currently. We have Terrans to thank for that, of course. Your anti-piracy fleets reduce that number from tens of millions to its current level. We're as likely to see pirates as, I don't know, dragons, unicorns? And to be frank, I pity the pirate crew who think that they can take a ship with two rough worlders, one of whom is Death World raised, five Death World sapients, and a merc beast mother aboard. They'd be in for quite the rude awakening. That is, in the last few moments, before they were reduced to a stain on the wall. Still unconvinced, he asks, what if they were Terran's cap? The question wrong foots me. Terran pirates? The thought is chilling. How had it never occurred to me? I'm about to open my mouth to say something, when the sound of warp falters and fails. There are a few moments of deathly silence. Then, the lighting switches to blue klaxon sound, and the computer pings all the hollow pads in the room. Computer, report, says Taylor, his hollow in his hand before anyone else's. The bright plume has been pulled from warp CSS. A ship has revealed itself within light minutes of current location projecting a 97% likelihood of it being a pirate vessel. Please arm and prepare all security personnel and deputies to repel boarding action. Taylor stands, his face harder than iron. He looks around. I'm giving anyone in this room who's sapient and whose cradle world is classified above an eight the option to be armed and deputized. I won't force you four, but if me Samus and Toon can't handle it, you might end up fighting anyway. Dawan Hasiak, Zunberry, and McLeod stand as well. There's not a shadow of a doubt that all of them are taking the deputization. Speaking clearly into his comm again, Taylor commands, Computer, this is a security override. I am temporarily relieving the captain of command to be returned after the threat is neutralized. Succession order following me is Brunhilde Samus's Aaron, followed by Tunel, followed by Jenny Mouse, McLeod, followed by Mazia Maje Zunberry, followed by Hasiak, followed by Krish Cookie, Dawan, followed by, uh, his voice falters for a barely perceptible moment. Command returning to Captain Cockcall. In the event of the deaths of all of the above, confine all crew to current location. Calculate most likely boarding point and clear a path to it from starboard dorm, deck five. Security officers and deputies are in the process of arming and readying. Understood, acting commander, rear loading bay projected as most likely board point. May personnel currently in rear loading bay be evacuated. Confirmed, guide them to nearest relative safety. He turns to Tun and Samus. Go to your rooms, arm yourselves. He turns to the others. You four, come with me, I'll arm you. The bottom has dropped out of my stomach. I disregarded the first rule of having a Terran on my ship. Listen to the Terran. If they say they have a bad feeling about something, don't do it. Guilt wells up in me as I start. Taylor, I'm sorry i not looking in my direction. He interrupts. Regrets are for the living, Cap. You can be sorry later. Now is not the time. Guard her, Sam. Keep her safe from the babies and anyone who comes into Triple M. Understood. Sam barks, understanding. I follow the group, including Taylor, to Taylor's room, and Sam follows me. By the time I catch up, Taylor's already pulled down the cover of his weapon rack and is taking holstered handguns down and handing them to non-security Triple Miss. For each one he gives out, he explains the safety and the user are ID that keeps anyone from firing it unless the current user transfers possession. I'm frantic, I'm loosing my head. We might die, and if we do, it will be my fault. I'm about to open my mouth before remembering Taylor's words. Be sorry later. I have never wanted to be sorry more in my life. Being sorry means there's a later to be sorry in. 
Please let this be one of those nightmares that Terrans tell me about. This isn't real. I can wake up scared, tap my beak against Korax, and then check on Takakak in her incubator. Please. All the deputy Triple M's armed now, the group makes its way back down the corridor to the balcony door. Just as the door is about to close, sealing me in here until I'm safe or dead, I call out, Victor! He turns. Hey, stay safe. Come back here alive. You hear me? He smiles. That's the plan, Cap. The door closes. The workaround. Victor's perspective. I listen for the sound of the door sealing behind me as we stride away down the access stairways. I hear it. If they're opportunists who are just looking to take anything that isn't nailed down, she should be safe. What's this distracting gnawing in my stomach? Did I eat something that didn't agree with me? I really can't afford to be compromised like this right now. Doesn't adrenaline usually fix distracting normal bodily function signals like this? You never feel tired, hungry, thirsty, poorly, or, or like you really just need to pop to the loo when your adrenal gland has been tipped out on your nervous system. <laughs> is it going to cause problems that I've revealed exactly what I think the pecking order is? Is Cookie going to resent me putting him last? Is Toon going to be insecure about going after Samus? Toon's smarter than either of us, but I need a clear head in charge. Toon's still a bit green. Whatever. That's a problem for Victor to address. If he survives. Right now, I'm not Victor. I'm acting commander. As we reach deck one, I consider jumping the railing to get the last 5M to deck zero. In the low gravity, it wouldn't injure me. Toon and Samus would follow. Best not. One of the untrained deputies might roll an ankle or crack a tail vertebra. We'll take the stairs. We reach the lowest deck and begin walking rearward, with the starboard section looming to our left and the central section looming to our right. Toon and Samus are beside me, in tight formation. The others are looser, but have all instinctively fallen in. Has anyone ever killed a sapien before? I ask, raising my hand. I glance behind me. My hand and Samus's are the only ones in the air. Has anyone ever killed a human before? My hand goes down. Hers stays up. Any advice? Don't hesitate, she states, her gaze not shifting from her line of fire. Good advice, I say simply, returning my foveal focus to the green spackle pattern that my shotgun is projecting into my field of vision via my translator to indicate what it's currently aimed at. Blue is a terrible color for emergency lighting. I know I can't expect the rest of the galaxy to share my color to danger sensibilities, but how did a plurality of species settle on blue as the danger color? Blue is the color of pretty things like sapphires, Earth's sky, Earth's seas, the moons of recall, fluffy, five of the eight merklets, tune. There's that stomach gnawing again. What the fuck is that? I glance behind me to check everyone's armaments. Samus has her assault rifle held at a 45 degrees downward angle in front of her. Her plasma broadsword is slung at her hip. Mage, Cookie, Hasi, and Mouse all have abysmal trigger discipline, but it doesn't particularly matter. The crew are all whitelisted, so we don't need to worry about friendly fire. I'm definitely going to need to give them a non-optional firearm basics course, though, if we survive this. Toon has four handguns currently arranged just below the center of her field of vision. She's a wizard with those. I've seen her unload 100 rounds in 6.3 seconds and not miss a single time. I've watched remotely as she wheels and dances in great spinning arcs of muzzle fire during moving target practice. Let's just check she has her, yep, four plasma daggers attached to her hips. Can't forget myself. Plasma falchion, check. Ammunition pouch, check. Shotgun, check. Loaded, check. Safety off. User ID light. Illuminated, all good. Did we have time to put on our uniforms? Probably not. The extra protection would have been nice. I should print some uniforms for the other four, in case this happens again. Or I should get Toon to do it, or Mouse. They're both better with the Nano Forge than I am, and Mouse is an engineer. Perhaps I could consult. Damn, this is my fault. I shouldn't have been so fucking coy about the shortcut. I'd advise against it, Cap. I'd prefer the cleared lanes, Cap. By the time I even brought up pirates, there were pirates minutes out. We might all die. If we do, it'll be my fault. Damn, Takak. She's going to die before she hatches, and it'll be her godfather's fault. Perhaps it really is bad luck for Rakali to tell, No, you're blaming Cap. Stop that. This is your fault. That gnawing. Oh, I recognize it now. That's fear. It's been so long. Plucked off the street at 16, thrown into a training course that probably put me among the most dangerous 10,000 sapients alive, and then turned loose on a galaxy made of cardboard. I haven't felt proper fear in years. Why not? It just felt like a swashbuckling sci-fi fantasy adventure. I was invincible. Did I not care if I died? Probably not. I love Cap, but some part of me always suspected that if I shuffled off the mortal coil, she could shrug and go get another SO from the pipeline we pioneered. I don't think that anymore. I've got stuff to lose now. Hassie, Cookie, Mouse, 
Mage, Samus, the Merklets, Fluffy, Cap, and Toon. Knowing now what the gnawing is, I squash it. I can be scared for my life when I'm alive. I can be sorry later. Take your own advice, Acting Commander. Those feelings aren't helpful right now. We reach the door to the loading bay, identify the place I want us to take position, and indicate the formation I want us to take. I tell the deputies to take the weaver stance, then have to explain what the weaver stance is. Like me, non-dominant side leg forward, dominant leg back and cocked, knees bent, gun at eye level, aim down sight, don't lock your elbow. Non-dominant hand steadying from beneath, tuck your elbows in. Was it the right choice to deputize them? Yes, as I said, they might have to fight anyway, and it's best to meet the borders with overwhelming force. Damn, I really hope these are just some hotshot Threndians or Clofully or something. I really hope they step off their boarding ramp, see five humans, a Don and a Saha's pointing guns that would shatter their bones from the recoil if they tried to use them, throw up their arms, and ask us to escort them to the brig. I really hope it's not. So close to Terran space, and it probably is. I see the ship approaching through the transparent boarding ramp. My doubt vanishes. It's certainly not a Terran ship, but those modifications. After I learned about the stereotype of Terran engineers, I went away and researched it. No garden worlder would modify a ship like that. Then this, what the fuck? My aiming reticule disappears? I check my indicator light and ammo display, both dead. Something else is wrong, but I can't quite put my finger on it. There's some sort of absence. What is that? Guys, I'm going to test my firearm. Don't be alarmed if you experience a gunshot. I point my shotgun at the ground in front of me and pull the trigger. A click and nothing. It's bricked. Damn. Analog firearms should have insisted. Victor, I think there's... I whip my head to Mage. He has an accent. I'm hearing English, but he has a Swahili accent. Why does he have an accent? Accents are the kind of thing that the translators compensa. My hand goes to my temple. I pull off the button-sized translator and examine it. Dead. It's dead. And so are we. Cockhall's perspective. I pace up and down the hall of Triple M. Rakali don't pace. This is a Terran stress reaction. Why don't Rakali pace? I guess because as flyers, if we're in a place that's stressing us, the natural thing to do is fly away from it. Can't do that in space. Can't do that in a locked dorm. My eyes are fixed on the security feet of my brave knights, advancing to meet the pirates. I know that humans are obligate omnivores. While they have an evolutionary history as persistence hunters, they never survive exclusively on meat. It's just hard not to perceive seven carnivores, five of them being hyper carnivores. That poise, that alertness, that control. No creature with those attributes has any business tucking into a salad. No, that's veteran tech hall talking. That's the tech hall who gouged talon marks into the floor of her fighter in rage as she watched three human fighters swoop in and decimate her squadron of dozens. They're gentle beings, all the strength in the universe and intelligence to match and still happy partying in their dorm and discussing their films with their four-eyed secretary bird captain. Miyazaki could have made them emperors with a word. She didn't. I bump into a wall for the fifth time. I don't have their peripheral awareness. I'm sure a Terran could look at their hollow pace and not bump into walls. My eyes are glued to the screen as the definitely Terran crude ship appears through the clear hatch slash ramp slash window of the loading bay when the feed cuts out. My hollow pad pings me, I answer with sinking horror. Computer, Captain, for the last 12 seconds, the bright plume has been engaged in a digital battle. Presumed to be initiated by the boarding ship, she's pausing. AIs don't pause. Why is she pausing? We're losing, Captain. They've already suborned counterboarding defenses and PA systems. They left atmospheric containment fields alone. It seems they are no more interested in vacuum exposure than you are. However, they also have an interference field engaged. The back half of the ship is enveloped. The result is that the holopads, electronic weapons, and translators of the security personnel and deputies can be inferred with near certainty to no longer be functional. I would take a moment to process all of that, but that's a moment we don't have. Why would they deploy an interference field? That would also lock them out of their weapons and translators. High likelihood of them sharing a natural language, thus having no need for translators. High likelihood that they possess overwhelming numbers and or analog firearms and intend to use those superiorities to force a surrender. Analog firearms. Victor said they would be better. Fresh out of so training, I was shopping for firearms for him and I didn't listen. Fuck. What can be done? Plan of action available, Captain, but there are obstacles. Tell me the plan first. Then tell me the obstacles. The attack has not affected the nano forges. High likelihood that they believe them to be of no strategic value. This is false. 
If you place your hollow pad in one of the nano forges on this deck, it can be modified to be able to nullify the interference field. That sounds simple. What are the obstacles? The range will be limited, Captain. It would only have effect within about 20, 20 meters of your hollow pad. All right, so I've just got to put my hollow pad directly adjacent to a fight between death worlders. No big deal, I say, heading into Dawan's room and standing beside his nano forge. I'm followed by a now mute Sam. The second obstacle, Captain, is that you can't be let out. This time my brain needs a moment to catch up. What do you mean can't be let out? Captain, as a limited sentience AI, the ship's control unit is utterly interdicted from disobeying a direct order from the one currently in command of the ship. You have been temporarily relieved of command and ordered confined to current location. The acting commander is beyond contact. Therefore, you are unable to be released. You will be required to find another way out of this dorm. You want me to... What? Tear through 505 centimeters of sheet metal door? Not even if I were a Terran, I scream. Captain, this plan has a 27.8% chance of success. That is the most promising of all potential courses of action by quite a long way. Please place the hollow pad in the nano forge so it can be modified, a process that will be completed in approximately three minutes. It is agreed that you escaping this dorm is ideal. Workarounds can be considered in the meanwhile. In disgust, I throw my hollow into the forge, which buzzes to life. I step back into the hall. Sam follows me. I give him a scritch as I think. He barks meaninglessly, at least to me. I walk up to the door and experimentally scratch it with my talons. No visible damage. Not that I thought there would be. There's a proposal in the GU's parliament right now to legalize full sentience AIs. If this attack had happened this time next year, I might have had her limiters removed. I could have removed her limiters regardless of its legality. If she were sentient, she could just open the door for me. A sentient AI is not bound to follow orders. Now, Tiffany of Glassbone nothing has to figure out a way through. Hundred Cree of Dorm Door. Not with an infinite supply of talons. Not with infinite stamina. Not with all the time in the world could I bend this door to my will. I freeze. I couldn't, but I turn to face the common room door. I know someone that could.